The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. This is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the very first lecture of our orchestration study of Debussy's La Mer. Before I start out, I just wanted to address one little historical anecdote that has cropped up in discussion in the group, and that is the claim that Ravel wanted to reorchestrate this work. Now, I feel that La Mer is one of the most perfectly orchestrated works of all time. And it's a little strange for Ravel to be claiming that the orchestration was exceedingly poor and that if he had a chance, he would redo it. And then for that same claim to be repeated over and over again by program note writers, biographers, and so on. But the only actual source for that anecdote is one of his friends, Henri Sauguet. And I don't know whether or not to believe that, or whether to believe that Ravel would have wanted him to repeat maybe an offhand comment, or perhaps something he said out of irritation, or some other reason. So I feel we can dismiss that notion that Ravel was actually planning to reorchestrate this. I think that that would have been, in the first place, somewhat impossible, because this work is already perfect. And in the second place, probably perceived as very arrogant by his fellow musical Parisians. So with that aside, let's take a look at the opening. Very slow, right? And you would think, well, 116 on the quarter note is actually allegretto, isn't it? But that's because you're not thinking in 6-4, right? So 6-4 is a compound time signature that is really composed of two strong beats on the first beat and the fourth beat. So from that perspective, it is actually quite slow at the beginning. So just really bum, 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 right? So that feels slow. Now here, right at the end of the fifth bar, note for note, going to 4-4 four, four time, it really becomes more like allegretto. So let's take a look at the orchestration. Since we've already discussed the instrumentation for all three movements in detail in the introductory video. Debussy starts off here with rolled timpani on a B, and that just continues on and on and on and on and on. And here, you know, even more pianissimo. And that is because these lower strings are coming down into the same territory as this rolled pitch. So he wants it to be even more delicate. This entire stretch of bars could have been dealt with just by notating tremolo bars or by having the trill line continue on without the additional trill marking over and over and over again. In the approach of some orchestrators, this might seem to imply that Debussy was suggesting that each new bar feel like the beginning of a new role, right? So this is not an approach I would recommend you taking in your works to put a trill mark over every single bar individually. If you are going to use the trill line, just have it cover everything until the beginning of something new, right? And in this case, you could also tie these to convey the sense that they are all connected, which they are. 
or you could just put a row of tremolo beams over all of these notes. That would be my recommendation. Okay, so this low B is playing a tremolo and accompanied by an octave below the double basses divisi. So the second set divisi are going to be playing this. And notice here they do enunciate right here this low B. And before then I would say do not in any way, shape, or form suggest that there is the beginning of a new note. It should all just blend in with the overtones of the timpani above. So what is Debussy doing here? Well, he is creating a very gentle tremolo and he is also emulating the feeling of the octave playing of cellos and double basses, right? So this could have been octaves in cellos, like Divisi, if you'd wanted. So double basses on this B, same written B, sounding an octave higher on cellos in normal concert pitch, playing tremolo instead of the timpani. But the fact that the timpani is playing the tremolo or roll creates a completely different sound than if it were a string tremolo. It really has this wonderful sense of presence that is way, way bigger, right? And it also creates a sense of anticipation that is much more on the edge. But right here, this enunciating downbeat is because of this push right here. So while Debussy does not want this note to be going up from pianissimo to piano and then down again, he doesn't mark any dynamic on it. He still wants this to be accompanied, this tenuto here, to feel like it has the same kind of emphasis, right? So, ba, ba, ba. What's interesting here, just harmonically speaking, is that Debussy seems to be writing in B minor and he's got these low Bs being held, tremoloed, rolled, whatever, and plucked on every strong beat by the other part of the Divisi double basses. But he is implying B major because he's going bum bum. Right, so we've got this bum, this low B, and then da da which is basically G sharp, which is one of the notes of the B major scale, right? So it feels like B major and this continues on and it gives absolutely no indication of any difference. All of these notes would be perfectly fine either in the key of B or B minor except for the G sharp, right? And that continues on here as well. This beautiful echoing F sharp, F sharp, G sharp, G sharp. It's so beautiful. Notice how there is a difference between the two. Really this is felt to be an echo because we have a little bit of tenuto on the second harp and none on the first harp. So the second harp should just be bringing out their notes slightly more than the first harp. And this beautiful rising here in the violas has a much different sense than if it had been played perhaps the top line given to one of the violin group, right? Because as it rises, it has that wonderful chesty sound as opposed to the more penetrating sound of the violin. So it's a little bit on edge, a little bit searching, right? So as that leads up to here, finally we hear the beautiful silky sound of the violins playing tremolo on these high Bs. Just bringing the harmony back into line with this low roll and the underpinning B. Now here is the place where Debussy can really make a statement and I feel that this is his 
Tristan chord, right? Wagner had his cool little chord progression. And right here, I feel that this is Debussy kind of showing, hey, you can be harmonically ambiguous and complex, but you don't have to be soupy, you don't have to be however he would have characterized very negatively at that point the more Germanic approach to harmony. So here he is doing something that is very plaintive and a little unsettled and could even be like the cry of birds, right? There's a sense of picturesqueness rather than program, right? So he is painting pictures with his music, but he is not saying this happened, then this happened. He's more like saying, this is my impression of what it feels like to be out on the ocean at 6 a.m. and the sun is just coming up, right? And everything is very chill and things feel mysterious. Maybe there's a little bit of mist on the water. And then you might hear the cry of a bird and the reaction of the artist is this feeling here, right? Rather than the notes themselves representing <laughs> precisely the cry of the birds. And that is what we call Impressionism, right? Because the artist, the creator, is relaying to you his impression, his emotional impression of something, his emotional reaction to something, rather than actually trying to depict it in music as a character. That is why Debussy is called Impressionistic. However, he rejected that term because he felt that there was more to his music than just that. He also used symbolism as part of his music. And if you really want to see his symbolist tendencies come to the top, you should really go see Peleus et Melisande. That is really a beautifully symbolic work and has the nascent feeling of Impressionism underneath, just really coming to the fore and making future works like this possible. Okay, well, not to get too sidetracked, but this is Debussy's answer to the Tristan chord, I feel. And it's just so beautifully rendered. Oboe in its lower middle register, still beautifully in control. If this were down, say, a major third or a perfect fourth, then it would be a lot more difficult for the oboe player to control the exact nuances of this, right? Some people still might find some problems bringing this F-sharp down to an absolutely beautiful diminuendo. That is one of the tricky notes for oboe. But a pro should have no problem. Then here we've got the A clarinet answering, first clarinet and of course bassoons providing the bottom of the chord and then I love the way that they all come together. Now notice that Debussy is actually restating ba -bum, but up a step ba -dum, da -da -dum. and actually if this had just been in B major then that could be a very, very bland kind of late romantic statement. But because he throws in this very ambiguous harmony underneath it, it is very mysterious indeed. At this point, the high strings start to descend, and they descend in a kind of a Dorian way, because there is a minor seventh, right? So if we think of B as being the tonic, so B... A would be a minor seventh, but then we have G sharp, which is the major sixth, going to F sharp the fifth, right? And that continues on four times in a row, descending each time. Very, very simply, really, it's just highest octave to the first and second violins, dropping an octave, and then the second violins plus the violas, and then violas plus the cellos. I mean, that's just really, really basic. But what is happening against it is what is really, really cool. This looks like a G natural, but it is actually C natural, sounding down a fifth. And here, this G, muted, first trumpet, is sounding up a fourth. 
So basically, these are octaves. You're hearing the English horn in octaves with the F trumpet, even though they're written on exactly the same pitches, right? So C octaves, but the C octaves are actually the major third of A flat Lydian, as we'll see on the next page. There's the root. There's our A flat. Written E flat. So that is just a beautifully unique idea over the tremolo B A going back and forth. This descends down to the fifth and then back up to G and then chromatically down to D. Now, when we get to here, notice everything is coming back. Just like before, we have the high B tremolo in the strings. However, the root is D. And WC does not want to hang on this idea of D for too long in the lower strings. He wants it to mostly just sit on the rolled timpani. So he gives it just enough of a foundation and then he pulls that out and allows this to feel even more lonely and less supported. But, interestingly, this is his same plaintive set of chords from the previous screen. It's just interpreted a little bit differently coloristically. So we have three bassoons rather than just two with the top bassoon taking the place of what the first clarinet did, more or less. And there is a slightly different voicing here, but I won't get into that. Then above, the first oboe and first clarinet play a beautiful unison. And this is just yet another nail in the coffin of that very strange uh, claim that oboe and clarinet shouldn't play exposed unisons in terms of solos. And all evidence points to the contrary, going all the way back to Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, which has that beautiful bum, bum, ba, da, da, bum, bum, which is clarinet plus oboe. And here, both instruments are very, very soft, and they are both in places where they can really control their tone beautifully. So you've got the lower middle register of the oboe, and you've got lower clarino first clarinet going into the throat tones. And that's all very easy to control for great players. Then here at the end, it's reduced even further as the strings descend. So it's just three-part harmony now, going down towards this interpretation of an A minor sixth chord. That's actually where you end up right here, is A minor sixth. But here, Debussy takes out the root A, but it's still the implied harmony. And I love the way that the oboe leaves off and the clarinets continue on just a little bit. There are lots of beautiful touches like this. Debussy deciding just exactly how long a certain note should last in order to blend in or connect or bridge or disappear from a texture or to insinuate into a texture. That is why I feel, once again, that the claim that Ravel had serious plans to reorchestrate this is just nonsense. And he may even been pulling his friend's leg a little bit. People have a tendency to take exactly what a great musician says at face value. And oftentimes the musician is just in a mood that day or is feeling annoyed about something and then says something that they change their mind about later or would feel embarrassed to know that anybody had taken seriously. I think that that was the case with John Lennon. A lot of the very famous outrageous statements that he made, he was just playing with ideas or thinking out loud and probably didn't intend for any of that to be taken as a pronouncement because to a certain extent he saw himself as a very ordinary person. So it's just everybody's worship of him that makes 
some slightly outrageous statement or very outrageous statement seem that serious. And the same thing is true of Ravel, too, I think, in this instance, if he actually even said that at all. So let's go back to the first screen and listen to both of these screens together. They really are one big introduction, which is going to lead to really remarkable things on the third screen, which we will check out in just a minute. That was, once again, Kaleidoscope Chamber Orchestra playing their rendition, for which I was given very kind permission by the orchestra and their founder to share with you. One thing to keep in mind as you listen to the music, just as this piece of orchestration is put together so beautifully and so complexly, the task for an orchestra without a conductor to interpret it is just as intricate in a lot of ways. Interpreting the music, listening to one another, playing off of each other, balancing, all of this stuff has to be done with everybody really cooperating and knowing what the other players are going to do. And it really takes players who trust each other and who understand one another. And that's what I find the most fascinating about this interpretation. Yes, there are places where the music is not balanced in the same way as you might have heard on perhaps professional recordings led by a conductor, but I find those differences fascinating rather than necessarily mistakes. It's really the way that the players have got to play in order for them to cooperate and work together without having to be led by another person. They lead each other. And if sometimes that means something comes out of the texture a little bit more strongly than you are used to, then that's just what that means. It doesn't really mean that that is a bad interpretation at all. Granted, no recording is perfect, but I feel that this recording just has so much life to it and so much great energy and great perspectives in it that I really prefer that approach and a recording of that approach to what we might otherwise be getting with a different orchestra, not to cast shade on any other orchestra that we've worked with. But I find that in this particular instance, this is a very exciting way for us to study this work. Now, on to <laughs> the structure of this wonderful build. And notice that I set up this screen so that you would hear the transition right? We would be studying that transition. I find that sometimes when I set up these screens, I really do sections and then you don't really feel the beauty of the change. You don't study that as much as you might have. So I put that in here intentionally. We are changing not just tempos, but also we're changing the whole feel of the music and the music is kind of falling off a cliff into another beautiful place. Or perhaps the boat of our perception is cresting a swell into another part of the ocean. Could this be Debussy's version of a fast forward? <laughs> this is dawn to noon on the sea, after all, and we have experienced dawn, and now we're sort of getting around to breakfast time, and Debussy is sort of fast forwarding us to around 8 or 9 a.m. I don't know. 
but here we've got this wonderful A and B tremolo. So this is just the tympanist tremoloing between two kettles rather than each head separately having a tremolo on it, which would require two players. It's so much better to play it with one player because of the way that the player can completely fine tune these dynamic changes, right? So it's better to have one person's brain involved. And there's also a certain sense of being slightly spread apart. A roll on a timpani will have a certain kind of character to it because of the rapidity of the separate strokes. Here, however, that has to be cut in half, and that in itself is still a valid way of playing and has its own character to it. So as this is going A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, the harps are playing the same two pitches back and forth, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, A, kind of stepping on each other's toes a little bit. So that is our rock bottom foundation, and the B's and the A's get taken over a little bit by the lower strings eventually. But Debussy is also interested in two other pitches, F sharp and G sharp. Bum, 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 bum. And those two pitches take over the lift of the opening statement. Da -dum. Now notice here we have cor anglais and first F trumpet, and they are at octaves apart. Now remember when they were at unison, they were an octave apart? Well, when they are written an octave apart this way, they are actually at a unison. That is what you get when you have octave transposing and key transposing instruments. So here we've got C sharp sounding up a perfect fourth and above C sharp sounding down a perfect fifth. And they are kind of writing that rhythm and notice that it repeats the sounding G sharp, written D sharp. Da -da, dun, dun, right? And it's actually starting to feel kind of nautical. There is a little bit of a triple time sort of a sway feeling to this. Now this is going to repeat three times and notice each time it's really brought back down to the same dynamic level. And this swell is going to feel strong right at the end, but it's really not all that hugely strong until really like the last few notes. Maybe like even just the last three notes. We're starting to get to like mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte, and then we arrive at a forte here. And it's quickly pulled back. Okay, so what is going on around all of that? as we have these notes going back and forth between F sharp and G sharp and B and C sharp, we also have these beautiful lines, octave clarinets rising up, and it all has a very pentatonic feeling, doesn't it? I'm just really harking back to gamelan music that Debussy would have experienced perhaps 10 years before and fallen in love with. So as this rises all the way up here to written A sounding F sharp, it is echoed by the flutes, which are very easy to hear here because the texture of the music is so delicate. All the same, Debussy hedges his bets by putting a bassoon an octave lower, which by the way, this is a little out there notating these bars in tenor clef. This really should be notated in bass clef, I feel, because there really is no need for this to be in tenor clef. I mean, the highest note here is an F sharp, and you should really be thinking about what is the lower note, right? It's still in a somewhat baritone register, these lines, so I really feel that it is much more suited to bass clef, even if it sticks up a little bit on top. 
Anyhow, it doesn't really matter. Any good bassoon player will be able to read that, but it's just a little unnecessary. So while these C-sharps are being held by bassoon and then an octave higher by clarinet, we have that same rising line, and it will sort of feel in the same place and higher at the same time because of the bassoon playing the same exact pitches as the second clarinet, right? So going back again, we have this time uh, two clarinets because the texture of the music is building with the second bassoon taking the octave below and of course playing the same exact notes as before but just twice as fast. And that is being doubled by first harp. And here we don't really need the first harp doubling because of the higher pitch of the first flute. And that repeats and each time just gets stronger and stronger because of the growing bustle in the strings, but actually the winds are not really going to increase unless the conductor sort of nods at them or they kind of get the sense that, hey, well, everybody else is starting at mezzo forte right here at the beginning of this bar, so why shouldn't we? So those are just decisions that you have to make creatively as the conductor or as an ensemble. So that is something that you should listen for as well when you get to this point in your own study after I play the music in a few minutes. So this is very, very interesting, going from a kind of a B pentatonic to D flat. But it's actually very logical. You've got these grounding notes of B and A. B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A. And then if you just think of D flat as C sharp and harmonically, D flat. So it just makes perfect sense, even though the notes don't actually physically walk up A, B, C sharp, actually D flat. There still is that same feeling, that same connotation, and it's a wonderful way of Debussy avoiding a perfect cadence. So once again, as I mentioned in the intro video, Debussy avoids perfect cadences as much as he possibly can, and sometimes there even is a perfect cadence, but it's so cleverly disguised by what the harmony is insinuating around it that you don't even notice it. You don't feel that feeling of, oh yeah, my expectations are being resolved here into the tonic chord. So <laughs> that's just one example of a clever strategy that is being used here. And when you think about it, with this music being very pentatonic and modal, coming before, there really is no need to resolve it at all, right? There was no urge, there was no feeling of resolution implied until we got to the end of this and then emotionally we needed some kind of resolution. So Debussy provides that in a very clever way. Now here we get into more feeling of pentatonic Javanese kind of music. And what I love about it is that even though it uses some of those same elements, you don't really feel that Debussy is attempting to be Asian here. You could listen to it and say, aha, well, that sounds like something from the South China Sea or, or whatever, or from Indonesia. But really, it doesn't feel that way because he doesn't overdo it. Do you know what I mean? Some people might feel with these little lines here, the clarinets plus the flutes, that there is something of that implied, but I don't really feel that because the focus is so much on the feeling of conveying an impression of the ocean that you really just see it in that context, or at least I do. This is really a lovely idea here. Bum, 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 right? The harps playing off of one another and then when you get to that bottom one, bum, bum, it's taken over by the two bassoons and that beautiful solid note that is still quite delicate. And that just provides context for these weaving patterns. And I really love what the cellos are doing in here. That is just beautiful. And these patterns just continue on into the next screen. But before we look at that, let's take a look at what's going on here once again. And this 
bum bum. It just plunk 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 by the second harp. Now here we are continuing on the patterns for the most part, including first harp. Here's where Debussy does something beautiful and once again modal rather than tonic, right? He's got these octave horns, Atu. And just remember your transposition. This is going to be C flat. Now, C flat in the key of D flat major is a minor seventh, right? So if everything is D flat, then C flat is C flat. So it's almost like a blue seventh, right? Bum, rather than da dum. Bum, 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 bum. Ba da 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 dum. Now notice here that the D is actually G natural, and what that implies is Lydian. However, it's not a true Lydian because it has a minor seventh. The actual Lydian has got a major seventh in it. So that's just a really wonderful modal idea. We have an altered mode here of a Lydian with a minor seventh. And that Lydian fourth is something that's used all the time in today's movie music. It's just to add that little extra optimism <laughs> to a phrase. And here it doesn't really add optimism, but it brightens the sense of harmony. Now notice that the actual note of G natural is avoided by all the other instruments, right? There are no G flats that end up correcting the harmonic picture so that it'll make more sense in the key of D flat, right? Our key signature of D flat. It's just kind of assumed that that will continue on. And the same thing goes for C flat. There are no C naturals to correct that. So if we take out the G and we take out the C, from our series of steps, how many notes does that leave in the scale? That's right, this is all pentatonic, right? So we are only dealing with five pitches. So it's a really wonderful, but very, very basic thing at the root of this music. The harmony is enchanting. It's not that these ideas are incredibly abstruse or as harmonically complex as say the Schoenberg that we just studied but they are so right. There's something about it that is just absolutely the right way to use it. Okay, now let's look at the return of with the second harp coming back in again. Here we've got oboe plus clarinet. Now this is very, very strange. On the original page of score, it was extremely compressed, so the copyist chose to notate this with an ottava mark over it. Needless to say, no clarinetist would have any problem reading a C-sharp above the staff. So for our purposes, this is completely unnecessary. I could have actually just renotated this entire thing without the ottava mark because I have more space here on these big screens. But I just decided to leave it there and just to show you that once again, as I have mentioned in an entire video on this topic, you do not need to put Atava over a woodwind part. Okay? just You just do not need it at all. Okay? Uh, most professionals actually look at Atava as a kind of a pain in the tuchus, right? It just kind of is something that is annoying. And of course, there are other wind players that are completely not bothered by it. Same thing is true for string players, if you've not watched my video yet. Sure, Atava can be useful in certain situations with certain players and so on and so forth, but none of this is really all that necessary. However, for harp, it is absolutely fine because the harpist's finger positions are the same no matter where they put them. But the same thing is not true for winds overblowing or strings finding new finger positions way way high up on the fingerboard. Okay, so let's not get too distracted from the main thrust here. 
So notice that in this page, WC just continues these patterns on and on and on again, sometimes putting a little bit of a dynamic swell into it, sometimes just adding a little bit of color behind what is playing in front of it, right? I really love these little swirling harmonies behind the ba da 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 ba da 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 You're going to feel it more than hear it. But let's have a listen to that. I will leave you with these two screens, and I'll be back in a few days with the second part of this lecture, which takes the music in a really amazing direction after this. But listen for all of those things, the way that B pentatonic turns into D flat, just the logic of that modulation. And for how the winds work together, really, that is something that I could have written an entire book about just on this particular piece. But the clarinet octaves and the flute octaves with the bassoon underneath, and then the way it all coalesces and gains in strength right at the end with all of the parts playing together. And the little motive coming in this time on F sharp and G sharp concert written C sharp and D sharp. And the way that the role is being played on A and B and so on. All of those wonderful elements that build towards this. Listen for how strong the build is. Does it really go up to like say a fortissimo or something like that? Or does it just naturally increase up to a forte and then drop off again? Different orchestras, different conductors, they have different ways of interpreting this. And that's also a beautiful thing about La Mer, is that it can be reinterpreted and personalized for different groups and for different conductors in ways that don't betray the essence of the work. And that is something that you can't really say about Ravel. There's kind of like one way to play Ravel to an extent. But with Debussy, there are many ways to play him correctly. And then just listen for this beautiful drop off to this low D flat and the way that the patterns emerge and just this lovely cello line right in here. And how the winds right in here are actually echoing some of the motion and energy of the cellos. And I will see you in a few days with part two of movement one. Mm -hmm.